I know for a fact there is a creator. I've seen his fingerprint. Gender equality. Very good, Penelope. Is this a joke? You think gender equality is a joke? No, but isn't this a maths class? Don't be so racist. I just asked a question. We don't ask questions. Questions are offensive. Yeah! Now, students, I trust you've all completed your research assignments. And remember, the person with the highest mark will be flying to New York to present their paper at the World Mathematics Summit. Well done, Penelope. Six out of ten. You too, Simon. Six out of ten. Hey. Be careful. You've been staring at her for ten seconds. What? It's a form of harassment to stare at a woman for more than fifteen seconds straight. And when I use the term straight, I don't mean to offend any persons of a non-traditional sexual preference. And when I use the term non-traditional, I don't mean to offend any persons who oppose historically normalised... Okay, okay, I get it. Unfortunately, Sunshine, your research assignment is only worth a one out of ten. I've used Fourier transform and mathematical methods in electronics to analyze the electrodiagrams of at-risk patients and calculate their risk of experiencing a heart attack. I mean, it's a new method, but it could potentially save thousands of lives. Seven. You barely even read it. You used red pen. What? Red is considered offensive in many religions. Why would you belittle everything down to a singular color? Well, humanity is a rainbow of beauty and spirituality. Yeah. Okay, fine. Seven out of ten, but that still means I get to go to the summit, right? The marking process isn't over yet. Now, because we live in a society based on equality, the total amount of marks are to be divided equally among our students. You've got to be kidding me. Well done, students. We're all equal. We're all average. Yay! But then who gets to go to the summit? Oh, we haven't added our privilege points yet. Don't you know anything? That is correct. Now, Penelope, you are female, so that's plus one privilege point. However, you are white, so that's minus one. But I'm also bisexual. Plus one. That leaves you with a total score of six out of ten. Simon, unfortunately, you're straight, white, and male. And cisgender. Yes, so that's minus four privilege points, which leaves you with a total score of one. It's only fair. Now you. You're male, and I don't like you. So that's minus two privilege points, but you are brown and sexually ambiguous. So that's plus two. That leaves you with a total score of five. Wait, why am I sexually ambiguous? And finally, Sunshine. Um, I'm gay, I'm trans, I'm Asian. <laughs> I'm overweight, I'm lower class, I'm unintelligent, unattractive. I've got hairs on my nipples. And I also got body odor. And I can't really run properly or tie my shoelaces by myself. And I once watched a pigeon die. Wonderful, Sunshine. That's. 13 privilege points. That leaves you with a total score of 18 out of 10. Well done, Sunshine. You're going to New York. Hooray, Sunshine! We knew you could do it! Let me see this. Ah! 
They've just written equality and drawn love hearts on a piece of paper. He expressed himself and it's beautiful. He didn't even spell equality correctly. We don't discriminate. This has nothing to do with mathematics. Do you think you're so great with your maths and your science and your facts? What about feelings, huh? Yeah. Feelings are more important than facts. Yeah! This is wrong. You're all crazy. <sighs> Stop violating me with your different opinions! I have the right to speak my mind! No, we have the right not to be offended. And that's more important. And if you don't stop verbally assaulting us, we will be forced to attack you in self-defense. You can't do that. Actually, we have every right to do so. And it's illegal for you to fight back. Yeah! This is insane. Prepare to die a noble social justice warrior. Death! <laughs> Ignore that. It will end. All right, hold, hold my sandwich. Oh, sure. Okay, okay. I'm sorry. Here, you take that. Here, here, you wait. Oh. Oh. Oh, my God. Okay. Oh, oh. Oh. All right, listen, B.O.B., once and for all. The Earth looks flat because, one, you're not far enough away at your size. Two, your, your size isn't large enough relative to Earth to notice any curvature at all. It's a fundamental fact of calculus and non-Euclidean geometry. Small sections of large curved surfaces will always look flat to little creatures that crawl upon it. But this, but this whole thing, it's just a symptom of a larger problem. There's a growing anti-intellectual strain in this country. That many, that it may be the beginning of the end of our informed democracy. Now, of course, in a free society, you can and should think whatever you want. And if you want to think the world is flat, go right ahead. But if you think the world is flat and you have influence over others, as would successful rappers or even presidential candidates, then being wrong becomes being harmful to the health, the wealth, and the security of our citizenry. Discovery and exploration got us out of the caves, and each generation benefits from what previous generations have learned. Isaac Newton, my man, said, I have, if I have seen farther than others, it's by standing on the shoulders of giants. Yeah. I get an amen. Woo. So that's right, B.O.B. When you stand on the shoulders of those who came before, you might just see far enough to realize the earth isn't flat. And by the way, this is called gravity. saying in science, extraordinary claims require extraordinary proof. So I am now going to make a wild, way out, extraordinary claim. The world is round. See, it looks like a table or a board. Now, once in a while, you might see mountains or hills, but those are just like little bumps on what looks like a flat earth. Well, here's what happened. People noticed that the place that we seem to be living would every now and then cast a shadow on the moon. And when it did, that shadow was always round. Now the only shape we know of that always casts a round shadow is a ball. It's our curvature of the Earth horizon model of science. And this blue stuff is like the ocean. And this boat, well, it's like, like a boat. Anyway, watch as ships sail away. They don't disappear all at once. No, first, the bottom will disappear. See, the bottom of the ship is gone. Now we can see midway up, and then the whole thing disappears. Now, ships came back. They didn't fall off a table. So people realized 
that the world is curved. I mean, it's a big curve, but it's curved. So, the process of testing claims, the world is flat, the world is round, is what we call science. Now, if you have a claim that can't be tested, that's what we call pseudoscience. The difference between pseudoscience and regular science is whether or not you can test it. The flat Earth, well, that didn't stand up to tests. The round Earth did. Extraordinary claims require extraordinary proof. The world is round. I'm out of here. What would you do with a brain if you had one? Do? Why, if I had a brain, I could... I could while away the hours, conferring with the flowers, consulting with the rain. And my head, I'd be scratching while my thoughts were busy hatching if I only had a brain. Thousands I'm, I'm of saying scientists the same have looked thing. into it. You think they're all wrong? That's so insane. You haven't looked into it. I So, so you spin, you know, when you spin pizza dough, it kind of flattens out. Yeah. It gets wider in the middle. And So Earth, throughout its life, even when it formed, it was spinning. And it got a little wider at the equator than it does at the poles. So it's not actually a sphere. So it's not actually a sphere. It's not actually a sphere. All I'm saying is when I look at all of it, when I look at the photographic evidence, or I look at the fact that we haven't been back since 1972, when I look at the fact that no humans except the Apollo astronauts have ever gone through the Van Allen radiation belt, the fact that no one's even done a flyby around the moon since then, it seems weird to me. When I look at the press conference and I see Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong and uh, Michael Collins nervous and weird and obviously like being deceptive after they came back. You can see on the back of his shirt a couple of upticks on either side where you would expect wires to come in on either side of that harness. They're often portraying that this is live. Of course these things are fully choreographed and edited in advance to make sure that there's nothing too obvious Look CGI to that me. gives away that this is a suspension in front of a blue screen hoax. The moon landing stopped in 1972 and we haven't been back. We haven't been beyond the Van Allen belts. We must solve these challenges before we send people through this region of space, through the waves of radiation. So, uh, so, so you spin, you know, when you spin pizza dough, it kind of flattens out. It gets wider in the middle and so Earth, throughout its life, even when it formed, it was spinning and it got a little wider at the equator than it does at the poles. So it's not actually a sphere. It's an it's oblate, and officially it's an oblate spheroid. That's what we call it. But not only that, it's slightly wider below the equator than above the equator. A little chubbier. A little chubbier. Yeah. Chubby is a good way. It's like pear shaped. But what masses? No, so, I could be wrong. It could be real. There's too many things. It could you be don't real, but it. they've been faking them so much they look like that's all those other fake ones. You've probably seen images like these from NASA. Grand and beautiful scenes of the cosmos and worlds beyond our own. I've always wondered who makes these and how do they do it? This is Robert Kurt and Tim Pyle, two multimedia artists at the iPad Caltech. Yes, the not they look enough. like I've seen so many fake ones that NASA admits that they're CGI composites. There's so many out there. So when you see this one, it's like, this is the same one. Yeah. There's so much fraud when you look into Astronomy it. Like, I don't trust shit. Look into it. They take scientific discoveries that look something like this and turn them into something like this. The faking of spacewalks in a swimming pool. In this vid, you catch a glimpse of someone wearing a scuba tank. In 2013, a gallon of water leaked into one of their spacesuits in a matter of seconds. NASA doesn't really have a proper explanation for how on earth this could have happened. Commander Whitson making history with her record for any American. By the time she lands in September, her tally will be 666 days in space. With the Earth supposedly 23.4 degrees, 
on its axis. And that leaves you, of course, the occultic number again, 66.6 degrees off. To look into it. Well, Earth is supposedly orbiting around the sun at 66,600 miles an hour. <laughs> That's so insane. You haven't looked into it. However, according to experts, these photographs are much less conclusive than one might think. Einstein told us that light actually is attracted by gravity. In other words, the path of light is not straight in a strong gravitational field. So uh, astronauts looking at the Earth uh, see a curved Earth. But what they don't realize is, is that it's not the Earth that's curved, it's the light taking a curved path from the Earth because of the strong gravitational field of the Earth that makes the Earth look curved. Yeah. How come when you check the internet it's valid, but when I'm on the internet it's not? You're not talking about the internet, you're talking about a uh, guy's YouTube video. No, it's not a uh, guy's, there's a lot of guys, there's a lot of people. Yeah. But they're just YouTube videos. It's huge. In October of 1929, Andrea again tried to focus the world's attention on the controversy by proving the notion the Earth spins to be absolute nonsense. It was reasoned that if a dirigible was to go aloft in England and hold itself perfectly static, then by the accepted theory, the Earth should rotate underneath it and New York should come into view some four or five hours later. In fact, England was never lost from view. And this is from NASA's official website. This one page spot the station, of course, referring to the so-called International Space Station, which of course does not exist. Take a look here. What do you see? As a form of mockery, they have the Flat Earth model on their website. A look here as well when it comes to the UN logo, which of course is basically the Flat Earth model. Through time-lapse photography, the velocity of these clouds has been dramatically increased. While they were actually drifting over the mountains at approximately 27 miles per hour, they now have the appearance of moving at well over 100, four times their normal speed. If the clouds were stationary and the Earth was revolving underneath them, this is how it would appear if the Earth was spinning at 100 miles per hour. Yet we're told that the Earth is spinning at 10 times that speed. The oh, science behind them is, is, is not it's verified big. by peer-reviewed journals. The science of the Earth the and gravity... The, the government science that's bought and paid for. What excuse do you have here? This is from ground level. As the guy with the camera pans back, you're going to see that boat and that buoy disappear right here. There you go gone out of sight, not around the so-called ball earth, it's all due to perspective, that simple. And that is, that's, in my opinion, is what the, uh, the globular earth theorists have done. They've just eliminated what they didn't know. The more honest approach is the flat earth approach, where you say, well, we don't know what's at the ends, but, but the ends are there. Sometimes I sit in my yard and I look at the stars and they really are quite amazing. I think about the fact that over the centuries and the millennium, I can't imagine that every single person that's lived has not at times gazed up that way and felt a sense of awe. We happen to be looking at the exact same thing that they looked at all those centuries or millenniums ago. It's strange how we've been given a story since birth, though. When we just look at where we are in the stream of time and we look at this century, and we recognize that we were all given a story from our mentors, our, our teachers, our instructors, our academic institutions, and our governments providing all the evidence for them that we live on a ball and we evolved from monkeys and before that rodents maybe and before that sea life like fish and before that invertebrates and ultimately a single-celled organism like an amoeba 
and somehow that magically evolved from a milkshake. Non-living matter turned into a single-celled organism. That's the beginning of life. A single-celled organism that, if you really examine it, is so complicated, it's ridiculous to imagine that it was not the result of creative design, intelligent design. Nonetheless, we're taught this. And if you're looking at the flat earth, here's some food for thought. Don't get too caught up in the term flat. You might think more about the term globe because this is what we are all indoctrinated with. And the more you examine the proof that we were all given to help us believe and digest this story, you see that the evidence is fake and it's fraudulent and it's bogus and it's not credible. Now, if you go to court and you start presenting a bunch of evidence that is not credible and that is deceptive and that the judge finds irrelevant or not acceptable by the standards of the court, there's nothing you can say after that that they want to hear because you've already proven yourself a liar. But we were all taught this story and... When you start to consider anything else and discuss it with your peers, you're crazy because they all know the story. And they will repeat parts of that story to you as if you've never heard the story before. You start looking at evidence that would suggest a flat earth, the flat earth is a much more realistic model. Although it does require, at some point, the acknowledgement that it is intelligent design and there must be a creator. But when you start talking to people about this stuff, they act like you're a fool and they try to make themselves feel brilliant by explaining to you something you already have been taught. None of us were raised in a vacuum tube. We know what the official model is. We were playing with the globe in kindergarten. And we were taught about the solar system in elementary school. And as we progressed through college and university, if you wanted to proceed that direction, you could go into astronomy classes, which would tell you where the galaxies are and how the universe is expanding and, and how you can look at the color of the stars and tell whether it's moving away or toward you. And just, there's an endless amount of detail to this story. But wait a minute, does that mean that it's true? Anybody who has been a fan of Star Wars or Lord of the Rings recognizes that the story is very, the story is very self-supporting and complex and detailed. So just because what they're teaching you about cosmological things in academia is complex and interwoven does not make it true. And it also doesn't mean that the people involved teaching it are in on the lie. It just means they're useful idiots that are repeating what they were taught. It's a self-perpetuating system. And at the top of it are the agencies that have the magical keys to the tools that allow them to reveal all of the newest discoveries like planets and universes and and the, you know oh they, they we have little robot rc cars on mars taking selfies give me a break a lot of people when they start looking at this flat earth topic start recognizing that it does make a lot of sense but when you start questioning the origin of the world and life and the things that we see and observe in the sky. It does start to lean in a very spiritual direction. It does make you question, are we the product of an all-powerful being that had an intelligent design and created a world that was perfect for human inhabitants? Our food tastes good, colors are delightful, the, the scenery and the mountains and the diversity of the world is so beautiful. 
The system that's teaching we live on a globe wouldn't recognize that. They're wiping out every beautiful thing on the planet, destroying the forest, poisoning the oceans, poisoning the air, paving over meadows to make slums. But after all, they think that we came from animals. And animals are inanimate objects for the most part in their minds. Which explains why they treat the populations the way they do. I was looking at a couple scriptures that caught my eye. Job 26 verse 7 says, He stretches out the northern sky over empty space, suspending the earth on nothing. There may have been societies in the past that believed we were suspended from something, but when you look at a chandelier, it's suspended from the ceiling. A boulder on the side of a mountain is not suspended. It's sitting on the earth. A mountain is not suspended, but a swing set is suspended from a tree limb. So this scripture implies that we're not hanging from anything, but it also does not necessarily imply that we are a ball suspended on nothing meaning invisible gravity flying around the solar system. <clears throat> I saw another scripture I thought was interesting too. It was in Ecclesiastes, first chapter, verse 5. My translation says, The sun rises and the sun sets. Then it hurries back to the place where it rises again. And the footnote, hurries back, says, As if exhausted from a journey. Does this suggest that the earth is in motion and that we're spinning and the sun came into view? Or does it actually imply that the earth is still, as the Bible says? The earth is immovable, as the Bible says. And the sun is, in fact, doing the traveling. Think about that. Side note on that. When you look at the most popularly used representation of the Flat Earth map, uh, we'll go with the USGS azimuthal equidistant projection. And you look down at that map and you look at the northern tropic and then you look at the southern tropic, or from this point I'll refer to the inner and outer tropic. As the sun goes around its path and hurries back to the place where it rises again. When it's over the northern tropic, doesn't it look like the deserts on that tropic latitude? In the north, the Tropic of Cancer at 23 degrees. Look at that ring of deserts that occur around the earth. And then go to the southern hemisphere and you look at that outer tropic of Capricorn and you look at all the deserts that occur along that path. Those could easily be the product of a sun traveling in close proximity to the earth and distributing its heat, creating those deserts. Now academia teaches us, no, it's just the angle of the earth when it goes around the sun. I don't really buy that. And here's something to think about. Look at the deserts in the northern hemisphere. That's when the sun is going around the Tropic of Cancer. Now it crosses the equator and then you, then it goes down and momentarily rests before it changes direction on the Tropic of Capricorn. And you see all the deserts that occur there. It goes over the equator twice, which means it receives that same direct intensity from the sun twice as frequently as the tropic on the northern and southern extremes of its path. The biggest deserts in the world should be over the equator because it gets direct overhead sunshine twice as frequently as the tropics do. But it's in transition according to the flat earth model. Just a thought. Look at those deserts. Look at where the tropics are. 
And imagine yourself if that could be the product of the sun 93 million miles away illuminating the entire globe. Or if it looks more like perhaps the sun is closer than they say. Because to me it could very well be that it's closer than they say and is responsible for those deserts in those tropic regions. Anyway, at the end of the day, you can sit on your back porch and look at the sky and you still see the same stars that were looked at by people centuries ago and millenniums ago and nothing has changed. It's like clockwork. Yet, the story they taught us is that we're traveling through the universe at half a billion miles an hour. I would think something would have changed along the view. But I'm sure there's some mathematical formula that tells us that what makes sense is not actually the way it works. You have to think about it if you're looking at the flat earth and you have to reason and critique and scrutinize and be honest with yourself. Start from a point where you don't give the original story that we've been given from birth any credibility at all. Make them prove it. And when you start looking at all of the frauds that NASA has generated along the way and presented as evidence of their activity to discover great things in space, you can't believe what they teach anymore. which leads you to other things. And if you're really looking for the truth, you have to be intellectually honest and there can be no sacred cows. You have to question everything. And when you find the testimony of a contributor like NASA to be fake, you have to throw everything out that they teach as fake and having no merit. And what does that leave you with? No pictures of the globe. No pictures of the space station. No fake uh, zero gravity spacewalks around satellites. And then what do you have? You have what you see with your own eyes. You have what instruments have demonstrated over and over that the earth is not in motion. You have a horizon over any body of water that you can see that has zero curve. There's so many things to consider. So don't let yourself be dissuaded from investigating this subject by peers that want to mock you. They're just not interested in the truth. Eventually everybody ultimately has to believe something. And we were all taught the same thing in school. And we were never taught to question what we were taught at school. So keep looking and keep thinking. You may find something really interesting at the end of that journey. Could be flat, could not be flat. There could, only, there could be 12 continents. How would you know? <laughs> <laughs> And that's a matter of how we draw it up. But I feel like with the world, with the Earth, when you stand back and you look at the horizon, you can see curvature. You can actually see it, unlike a dinosaur or something. Yeah, or if you fly in one direction, you'll come back around, which, is, which in a flat world probably would not happen. That is true. That is true. But these guys don't go around. They go to Cleveland, and then they go to... <laughs> With me now, Bill Nye, CEO of the Planetary Society, and of course, the science guy. Good to have you, Bill. Good to see you, Craig. Todd Aiken says believing in evolution requires faith. Paul Brown says it's a, it's a lie from the pit of hell, a lie straight from the pit of hell. What goes through your mind when you hear things like that? Well, first of all, uh, I, as a science educator, have failed. I failed. No. Evolution was discovered. 
It's not something people made up. It was discovered, and uh, the evidence for it is astonishing. It's overwhelming. Now, one thing I really want your generation to embrace is that the Earth is a closed system. We cannot leave the Earth. There's no place to go. There's no place to throw your trash. And I wouldn't be surprised if maybe not you, but your kids develop ways to mine our landfills. We throw away so much valuable stuff right now, especially raw materials. I may be wrong, of course. Always maybe. So how do we know how do we know the earth is not flat? We don't. It's flat. Okay. <laughs> okay. Glad we that. On <laughs> so no, 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 so here it is. Here it is. Um, if you are small, as we are as humans, and that is the entirety of your and that is the source of the of your understanding of the world in which you live, then of course the world looks flat. That's not any different from being a child watching television and, and is presuming that the people you see on TV know you. They don't know me. Well, if you're a little child, you think they do know you because you are the center of your own universe. And to mature out of that is very hard, not only when we grow up as humans, but also as we grow up as a civilization. To realize that the Earth is not flat and that it's round means you're not in the center of the earth. Some of the earliest civilizations we have records of were in the Middle East, okay? And uh, that whole area is called the Mediterranean. Well, Mediterranean translates to Middle Earth. The people lived there were, were sure they were in the middle of the earth. That can only be true if you think earth is flat. Well, we have many lines of evidence to show that earth is round including Apollo photos of the round Earth. Okay. The only reason I reference that, of course, is you got into kind of a, a battle on Twitter about that a while back, early, earlier this year. Yeah, I, it, it, it wasn't a fair battle when you know you're right and you know the other person is just completely regressed in their thinking. Uh, I only jumped in because there must have been an overlap in the Venn diagram of the followers that I have on Twitter and the followers that B.O.B. had on Twitter. And I don't know how big that overlap is, but it was sufficient for people to come to me and say, you know, B.O.B. is saying Earth is flat. you got to stop him. Say something. Save him from himself. And I'm saying, well, ooh, well, 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 I'm looking, and there they were. And so, and I, I would have left it alone, because I don't have time for this, until I saw him saying, I use physics and math to show that Earth is flat. Not those are fighting words. Okay, if, if he says he's invoking physics and math, let me, let me see where he claimed to do so. I looked where he claimed to do so, and it, it was profoundly ignorant of formulas and physics related to the physics of establishing the size of the earth. Now, I don't mind that people don't know things. That's just plain old ignorance. Ignorance shouldn't be thought of as a bad word. All right? Ignorance just simply means you don't know. But if you don't know and you have the power of influence over others, that's dangerous. If you don't know and you don't know that you don't know, that is particularly dangerous. And so, so I, I, and I don't blame B.O.B. and I, don't, I blame the educational system that can graduate someone as, into adulthood who cannot tell the difference between what is and is not true about this world. This geocentricity thing, look, I'm not saying that if you believe in geocentricity, you're a complete idiot. If, if you believe in the flat earth, you are a complete idiot. I'm just, let me go on the record and say that. But look, if you believe in geocentricity, I don't believe that you're a complete idiot, okay? I can see how you could believe that, but it's false. And the, the thing is, I used to just kind of ignore geocentricity and just think like, well, whatever, who cares? It's not really that big of a deal. But it seems like geocentricity is like a gateway drug into the flat earth. You know what I mean? That's what's dangerous about it. It's the gateway drug. <laughs> I'm serious, okay? So what, what you have now is you have people saying these stupid things like, 
What do you expect me to believe we're spinning at a thousand miles an hour? You know, I don't feel it. Okay, but here's the thing. Because, you know, the Earth's spinning, right? Okay? I mean, if we're going a thousand miles an hour, I mean, you know? Or if we jump, we're going to land like, you know, a few feet over or whatever. But here's what they don't get. And I try to explain to them. And they're like, why is the water so peaceful if we're spinning that fast? But here's the thing. Get on an airplane. How fast does an airplane go? About 500 miles an hour. Right? So if I get on an airplane and I'm going 500 miles an hour, I have a glass of water on my tray table and it's very peaceful. It's not going anywhere. And I can jump up and down as many times as I want and I'm going half, they're saying a thousand miles an hour, the plane goes 500 miles an hour. So why can I jump up and down and keep landing in the same spot? Why is it not just <laughs> Because the reason why is because everything's moving. It's not just the earth that's spinning, it's the atmosphere that moves with it. It's, it's a pressurized cabin as it were. Right? I mean, the air and the atmosphere and everything, it's all spinning, so it's all going the same speed. And, and here's how you know it's spinning. Because you can see everything moving. You can see the sun moving, the moon moving, and all the stars moving. Now, here's the thing about that. No, that we're not standing still, and everything around us is spinning. But that's about as ridiculous as saying, well, how do we know that the plane's not standing still? And it's the whole world that's going by. Here's why, here's why that, and look, I know I'm getting on geocentricity tonight. And I hate this stupid subject, but I, it's the gateway drug. So I got to bring this up. Just, you know, we need like dare, dare to, to say no to this stuff. Okay. So the thing about, you know, D d you know, dad, what is it, mad or mothers against drunk, you know, science or whatever. But anyway, the, here's the thing about it. Okay. And I look, I, I feel like I have to teach this stuff. Yeah. I don't like science that much, but I feel like I have to like talk about science just because to make sure that people know what's up with this. So anyway, where were we? Yeah. yeah. Sorry, sorry. No, that's all right. You see oh, like yeah. the bright light back wow. there? Incredible. Wow. Wow. Still see it? That yep, yep. Awesome. It's in the camera. Yeah. Look how fast that's going, man. Look how fast. Are you getting it on video? Yep. Yeah, folks, going off the right side of the aircraft right now. Those of you on the right side of the aircraft, you can see the spaceship. Wow. If you have the left side of the aircraft, you can probably see people on the right side of the aircraft looking at the spaceship. the trajectory of the space shuttle. It doesn't go straight up. It always goes in a curve um, and out to sea. 
The point is that they, they actually go horizontal, the space shuttle goes horizontal, it never goes any further up, it goes horizontal, um, very, very low down in the, in the atmosphere um, because it, lets, it drops its um, external tank um, while it's still in the atmosphere. Um, so, you know, it's, it's still in the atmosphere while it's uh, horizontal, so it never gets any higher and it goes out of sight, not because it goes too high, because it goes too far downrange. Um, and it seems that uh, nobody's ever on the space shuttle. And the proof of that is the Challenger disaster. Um, in uh, I it was 1986, the Challenger exploded just after takeoff and killed seven astronauts. But it turns out that six of the astronauts are still alive and uh, most of them are using their original names. Um, and you, you, know, uh, you can find pictures of them, they're, they're using the same names, and they're, they're doing ordinary jobs now. and the earth and the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep and the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters and God said let there be light and there was light and God saw the light that it was good and God divided the light from the darkness and God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament, and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. And God called the firmament heaven and the evening and the morning were the second day. And God said, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters called he seas. And God saw that it was good. And God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit whose seed was in itself after his kind. And God saw that it was good and the evening and the morning of the third day. And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years, and let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also, and God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth, and to rule over the day and over the night, and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the fourth day. And God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life, and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. 